special shout out to our sponsor, Qualia. Qualia is the category creating digital closing platform used by thousands of lenders across the country to seamlessly work with their title and escrow partners. By working better together, Qualia is powering lenders to deliver a differentiated closing experience for their clients. Through real-time communications, closing status updates, and workflow management, Qualia brings lenders together with home buyers and sellers, title and escrow agents, and real estate agents for a secure and seamless closing experience. Qualia is proud to have been awarded the Housing Wire Tech 100 Award for real estate as well as CB Insights FinTech 250 Award. Discover how you can work more efficiently with your title and escrow partners at qualia.com forward slash innovators. That's Q-U-A-L-I-A.com forward slash innovators. Hello, everyone. If this is your first time joining us, welcome to the Mortgage Innovators Podcast, where we deliver fresh and hopefully entertaining insights on all things mortgage and the innovation propelling our industry forward. My name is Dave Zitting with Avenue Technologies, makers of the Intraline platform. And every Tuesday, you can find our rotating group of co-hosts who all share their own unique connection to the industry. I'm thrilled to have my fearless and brilliant leaders, Sue and Michael, with me here today. How are you guys doing? Doing good. Good to good. see you. Good, how you doing? Thanks for, thanks for jumping in today. Um, real quick, guys, before we get into it, we want to make sure that you all know about the Mortgage Innovators Conference 2022. It is back in person for an experience you do not want to miss. We can't wait for you to join May 2nd through the 4th, 2022, at the Hilton Anaheim. For the latest information on registration and sponsorship opportunities, which are awesome, and we welcome those, head to mortgageinnovators.com forward slash conference. That's mortgageinnovators.com forward slash conference. So, Sue and Michael, I thought it would be really fun, if not bold, to put some hard predictions on the table for 2022 uh, related to, you know, innovations uh, based on industry trends, behind the scenes conversations and various innovations that are well into development, maybe some M&A conversations that we're seeing out there. What do we believe will be deployed in the market next year? And at the same time, time these innovations will make a material positive impact on our industry or maybe you don't think they will um that's that's what's on the table today and um let's just jump right in sue i'm going to start with you i'm going to start right. with you well i'm going to make a bold prediction i think there's going to be less volume next year <laughs> i know i know it's not crazy. very innovative <laughs> So, so what I will tell you is that when I look at um, what I believe is going to be happening next year based on the conversations that I have been hearing, some behind closed doors, um, there's definitely going to be a lot of M&A activity. Um, and I, we talked last time, last session about some of the uh, M&A activity on the vendor side, but there's a ton on the lender side. And what that means is that people are going to be looking at their technology solutions and making decisions about which ones, which ones are, which are we going to keep, you know, which one is working best. And so I, I will definitely say I think there's going to be some some shakeups, and I think there's you know probably going to be incumbents. I know that conversations are happening where um, you know one of the the biggest topics I'm hearing lenders talking about right now is you know thinking about their LOS, whatever their incumbent might be. You know, are they going to make a change? Um, I think over the last couple of years you couldn't do things like that. You know, you can't make big technology transitions when you're in the midst of that kind of volume. Now everybody's getting a chance to pull up and say kind of okay. What have you done for me lately? And who do we want to be our, our partner going forward? And it's always about not just necessarily what you've done. It's it's really companies choosing, you know, what what horse do they want to ride into the future? So I I number one predict that there there is going to be a lot of shakeup with the MA activity. And I think it's um, advisable for all the vendors out there um, to ensure that they're real close to their customers and that they're continuing to to innovate because people are absolutely going to be making tough decisions over the next year. Yeah, I hear yeah. that. No doubt about it. You know, the market's shifting, changing so fast. So many things are rushing in. Um, you know, it's tough when there's a lot of volume in this business because you don't have time to deploy as much innovation. You got plenty of money to spend on innovation, um, but you're just trying to get stuff out the back door and keep yep. people from screaming. So all of a sudden, everybody uh, jumps on the innovation bandwagon and the M&A bandwagon, I think, is a big one because this was such a big volume couple of years that, you know, on the other side of this, I think there's a lot of question marks for sure. Michael, 
Um, would love your thoughts, and then I'll, I'll share a couple of mine. Mine are probably a little bit more in the in the weeds related innovation, but Michael, I'd love your kind of global thinking as well. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think Sue hit it spot on. I think there's going to be a lot of assessment going on um, because I think, again, over the last couple of years, people were just adding to their tech stacks and adding, you know, features. And I think that, you know, as we go into, you know, the volume drop, Sue's bold prediction, hadn't heard that one yet. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think, you know, with that with the margin compression, people are really going to be assessing those stacks and, you know, what's working, what's actually driving value, driving revenue, you know, what's the ROI. So I think you're going to have a lot of data coming in, you know, where, where lenders are going to be really looking at that and, um, you know, making decisions. And especially to her point as well, you know, you've got people now with two platforms because they've, they've made an acquisition and, you know, so they inherited an existing contract. And so you're really going to see companies getting, I think, put to the test against one another versus, you know, just the, the testing environment or the, you know, you know, again, being the incumbent and, and somebody try, trying to come in and uh, take that. So I think that's going to be a big piece. Um, I think for another thing that I think is going to be interesting is really things that we've been talking about over 2020 and 2021 that are going to go into effect, I think, in 2022. Things around really the e-close. You know, we've been talking about it and you ask 10 different people what an e-mortgage is and you probably get 10 different answers. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think I was reading the study and I think it's like, 75% of lenders consider themselves between 50 and 75% of the way into a full e-mortgage. So there's very few people that really feel like they've got that full end-to-end. -end. And we know that some of that's been restricted by, you know, legislation that I think some of that's going to be changing coming here in the next uh, year. So I think that's, you know, the, the, the full e-mortgage, the full e-close, those types of things I think are really going to um, become reality. And additionally, um, you know, Data being used, um, you know, by by the GSEs. I think, you know, there's been talks. Uh, there's been talks about, you know, things like, you know, the VOIE, VOA data that's coming in, you know, from some of those those vendors. Um, you know, Fannie and Freddie are putting them through stress tests right now, and you know, there's there's talks about, you know, is that going to allow for certain conditions to be cleared on your DU and LPs? And, you know, how is that going to streamline and create efficiencies and also a better borrower experience, which I know we've talked a lot about. So I think that that's actually going to go into play at some point in 2022. Yeah, Michael, I totally agree. And and on the e-close too, you know, getting out of the hybrids into the fulls. So I think you know, a lot of people are like, yeah, we're doing e-close. And it's just like, really? Um, but that full e-close, I think, I think COVID had a big help with some of that um, progress. And then data, you know, that's my big thing. That was kind of where I was really headed. And, and it's really interesting because, you know, Brent Chandler uh, shared some brilliant insights with us in our last uh, deployed episode that we put out last week. And, and I just thought it was so astute. It was spot on. And, and how there's just this, you know, this, these buckets of different data, there's stuff that um, the lenders could do that is not even legislative, right? Um, and, and, you know, I do see and I predict that like you, Michael, that the GSEs are going to get more involved with how can we use some non-traditional data? Mm -hmm. um, and, and because it's such, it's, you know, we, we call this like non-traditional credit, non-traditional income. Well, when such a huge percentage of the population are using it, when, when does it become non-traditional? When is yep. it non-non-traditional? <laughs> it's traditional, yeah. yep. you know? And I think that the world is waking up to that. And, you know, we can see where the capital markets is starting to wake up to innovation and products as well. Uh, we got, you know, you know UWM is putting out, like, they just put out a really awesome new uh, IO jumbo. You know, we got other co uh, companies coming out with some super cool um, non-QM products. Um, I think that we'll see a whole lot of um, innovation in product coming there. And when things start getting tight, you know, loans aren't falling out of the sky anymore and margins aren't like this massive thick margin, um, all of a sudden, you know, you start to see product innovation. And, and we've made such headway in the collection of data. Brent pointed out huge gaps, I get it, but more than we've ever had before so that we can start to take this information, get it fed into our automated engines, and try to find ways of taking 
being in reality what is not so non-traditional anymore and really helping a greater amount of the public but also i think for folks um that have more traditional income or even you know self-employed income and these sort of things i think there's a lot more diy diy capabilities coming into our our uh, experience probably mid to end of next year yeah. where consumers you can see some of these amazing companies out there where consumers are kind of walking through this process less hand holding more that they're able to kind of supply to the system the system's able to read the data um analyze uh their uh self-employed income we've seen freddie mac put out their tool recently super super cool there's other tools out there that i think are going to become really commonplace in 2022 so i think uh big time data utilization product innovation um new products coming to market that fit better with what we've been calling non-traditional for decades is not traditional not, not it's becoming traditional um and and i think that there's just a ton of innovation on that side as well um very cool so how do we mesh that up i mean looking at m a looking at margin compression looking at new products hitting the market from the capital markets a new entrance from lenders willing to take on certain risks um gses uh getting involved who are the winners you know i mean what do you guys what do you guys see out there if, if you were to place a a healthy bet on a winner um who might you place a bet on oh well i'll tell you my thoughts um, I actually, I love what you just shared because the kind of the buckets that I thought about the innovation in was going to be data, efficiency, and customer experience. And yeah. I love that you pointed out that the data has to be actionable, right? You have to be able to do something with it. So, you know, there's people have been talking about data, 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 but are you doing anything? You know, we're, we're like, you think about we're lousy with all this data, but is it actually, is there insight and is it actionable? So I think about um, companies like, um, there's a company called Ingenious, Ingenious Data Solutions, unbelievable data in terms of helping people recruit, right? Recruit, fair lending. Um, I don't know if you've gotten exposed to them yet, but that's one, you know, fairly new startup. But um, as I've looked at their data and their data sources and what they're able to tap into to find out, you know, to, to serve up to a lender, here's what all of the different loan officers are doing. Here's who they're, um, both loan officer and realtors, who's their partner with, you know, can, you know, make sure that you're recruiting diversity, um, understanding who's moving from this company to this company. I mean, there's just tons of information there from a recruiting standpoint that's very actionable. So I think that's the key is the companies that have data that are providing it to be actionable, whether it be a sales boomerang, something like that. It's not just data, it's actionable. Um, the efficiencies, the, you know, the, one of the things I would say is that I, as lenders are evaluating their tech stacks, a big piece of it is to be careful that you're not viewing it with the same goggles on that you had for the last couple of years. Um, as an example, I'd say, you know, people that, oh, you know, you hear people complaining, like my loan officers aren't using this thing. They haven't had time to be using this thing. That doesn't mean that that thing should be thrown away. It means that you need to reevaluate it with your new purchase goggles on and make sure that you're not evaluating with the refinance muscle memory. I will tell you that I actually am a little skeptical of, a, of the, the value of a full 100% e-closing, quite honestly, because I think that's super value for refinance. Um, but somebody who's purchasing, I don't know if I'm expecting to, to just close off the phone. And, well, it's know, all it's a celebration i mean who does i don't care I mean, who doesn't want to be it with your clients to celebrate exactly and get another client from it so yeah. I, I tend to agree with you on so that <laughs> goggles on and finally with customer experience because i do think that the customer experience the the market is saying and consumers are saying that's a new battleground is what kind of experience people will pay more they'll pay you know higher interest rates they'll pay more fees if they're getting an incredible experience especially with a purchase where it's an emotional transaction where something a life experience is happening so those are the three buckets so i think the companies that are providing that whether it be you know qualia is providing a ton of efficiency right you've got finlock are really helping you know incubate those leads and, and bringing them um, in through the process um you know there's there's a lot of great companies out there but those are the ones that i kind of look at and say i i see some winners in there yeah i totally agree with all of that so yeah. Very cool. Um, Michael, what do you think? What are you betting on? Oh my goodness. You know, I think it's gonna be some of the uh some of the the lenders that really take some of that that 
technology that's been used in that DTC DTC space. You know, the the like what you mentioned earlier is you know the borrowers being more empowered to do more. You know, upfront for those that want to do it. And I think you know a lot of those you know direct to consumer type models have that type of technology in there because it's all about the speed. And I think that the lenders that have you know the traditional retail mortgage banks that are able to leverage that technology to create that type of experience, but then really partner in with their loan officers. I think that those are going to be the ones that really win the recruiting battles, that really win the M&A battles, um, because I think that that's what people are looking for. They're looking for that technology that really streamlines things, um, but still empowers their their loan officers for those people that want that that human you know you know relationship there. And I think the one thing, and I think Sue hit it spot on when she was talking about the e-close. I actually think some of it too is going to be the way that we're messaging things, because I think that one thing that happened even in the last couple of years with e-close is it was almost sold as like a benefit due to COVID, right? It was like, oh, you know, instead of sitting in front of your your title company for an hour, it's only going to be 30 minutes, and it's like, okay, well, I'm still exposed to people for 30 minutes, so how is that really, you know, benefiting me? I look at it as more as like an LO tool. You know, really is instead of, you know, you're you're at the, you know, you're at your COE deadline and you have to close the loan that day. And now the borrower is looking at docs that they might not agree with and they have questions and I'm not ready to sign this yet or this payment's higher. I look at it as more as like getting it to them a couple of days before to vet out some of those questions to make sure that they're super comfortable when they're walking in. So I think some of it is going to be to the, the companies that really get in front of the marketing and really pitching the value to the loan officers, not just the the borrower side of the of the e close. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I, I think there's just a whole lot we need to flush out there. It's it's you know such amazing technologies come to the market and and there's this kind of intention and it ends up being great, but it ends up being utilized a completely different way. And and you know you're both alluding to that. It'll be interesting to see. I think it's really hard to predict. Um, I predominantly work within the purchase market, but, um, and I tell you, you know, it, it is more emotional than it's ever been. You know, we have all this great technology and all these automated this, that, and the others, but at the end of the day, you know, show, somebody's showing up with some uniqueness and in one aspect of their four C's of finance and, you know, all bets are off. And, and, and so, uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Uh, really quickly, before we run out of time, we just got a couple more minutes. Um, some other big items that I don't have an answer on, but I have a few thoughts and curious what you guys think about um, evaluation. Um, love to understand, or I'd love to uh, hear some predictions related to the appraisal industry. Do you guys have anything uh, anything kicking around in your, in your uh -oh. brilliant minds on that front? Thing I'll tell you is I know it is the biggest pain point that I hear from every lender right now, and obviously volume is going to you know help with some of that by its nature. Um, but you know there's a every time there's a there's a problem like that, a solution rises up, and so I don't know what it's going to be, Michael. Maybe you've seen some things, but um, I do know it's it's one of the biggest pain points that lenders are dealing with right now. One of the biggest, by far, pain points that we are dealing with right now, um, and I and I agree. I think that I I don't have a full prediction on it, but you you've been hearing about they've already been inching towards certain things, right? You know, doing the you know the desktop appraisals, doing more stuff where it's not requiring somebody to actually get out to the you know to your house. I think the more you know, even the more that I see, you know, I log into you know my Zillow and Redfin account on my you know on my personal house. And it's like, I see more and more data popping up in there. And I'm like, how do they even have that? Like, how do they even like know that, you know, already knowing like- They're listening to you me. Know that, <laughs> yeah, like, like I didn't go in and add that I have a pool now. Like, how did you guys already know that, you know, oh, I have a pool that like- That'll like yeah, me. <laughs> yeah, so it's like those types of things I think are gonna tie into the, the appraisal world, you know, more and more. And, and, and again, the big data aspect of it, right? Yeah, I, I agree. I, I I tend to think about how much data the GSEs have and how many problems could be solved with it. Um, there's just so much we could do there, but I do think that the innovation's got to start where the data is. Um, and I do think there probably can be, there's such obvious 
capabilities that year after year, I'm like, we haven't done that yet. Are you, are you kidding me? So I'll, I'll not a big bet, but I place a bet that the GSEs kind of start leading a little bit in, in that area and that endeavor. I think that'll be good. Um, last quick thought before we wrap it up, cost to produce. It's insane. It's became really expensive. Of course, when there's a lot going on, there's wasted money, so much waste when there's refinance volume, right? So many mistakes and so many um, places where we see money fall off the table. And so um, I, I think that that's elevated that number. But with all of this that we're talking about in all of these areas, does the cost to produce come down in 2022? I mean, it's we keep saying it's peaked and it's insanely expensive and that all yeah. passes on to the consumer. So yeah. who who's going to win the competition, the competitive game, right? Where we're now making it less expensive to produce. I, I, I mean, me personally, I'd say some of the POS, some of the innovation that's happening there. I mean, we talked last week about Simple Nexus and Encino. Um, actually, I bought some Encino. I think that's, I think that's going to be a good play. Um, nice. But the, those who can make that, you know, whether it's Blend or Simple Nexus, you know, changing, you know, making that a really good upfront experience and the more that they can pull into that, you know, I think that's going to be a big deal. Some of the companies like Candor or, um, you know, Loan Toolkit, um, AI, there's, you know, there's, there's some other vendors out there that are, you know, it's incredible the difference that they're making in terms of being able to clear conditions without a human being. And I'm all about, you know, people being involved. It's a people to people business, but we have to make this more scalable and more efficient. And so yep. I think that's, that's where we're going to see some of the, um, some of the innovation come up is helping reduce some of that cost and the operational side of things, particularly. Man, it's gotta happen. Yeah. Michael. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think it's going to be, you know, one of, I think who's going to win in that, you know, really is, who comes up with the true end-to-end -end solution that helps take out some of those layers of cost? Because right now, you know, I think the lenders across the board would say it. There's so much overlap where you know, you know, this thing does just two things that this thing doesn't do, but they do six of the same things, and so you know, we're paying for both. And I think that that's where some of those, you know, those assessments and some of those tough decisions are going to come into play from the lender side. Because again, I think the last couple of years we were able to do it. We're not going to be able to do it, you know, in 2022 and truthfully beyond that, right? You know, because, you know, the, the margin compression doesn't seem like it's going to be going away anytime soon with more and more competition, you know, coming into it. So exactly. So, you know, it, it, I think that, you know, whoever figures that out with a, with a cost effective end to end solution is really going to um, win that. Totally agree. Well, guys, that about wraps up our budget of time for today thank you so so much it's been a pleasure uh, to collaborate with you as always and i certainly want to thank our audience for listening to today's episode and if you like what you heard make sure to subscribe to the mortgage innovators youtube channel or wherever you podcast until next time